so as a last speaker, it's always nice to uh, have at least the opportunity to respond, respond to all the other um, speakers of the day. And it's especially interesting to close the loop to the first lecture, Patrick's uh, introduction of uh, uh, the architectural potential of richly and highly articulated uh, environments and structures. And we heard about the uh, role of structure as the design driver and how that can be incorporated. Uh, and um, I want to talk about um, a smaller subsection of that and how uh, interesting lightweight structures made from composite material uh, can actually uh, uh, actually embrace that kind of uh, potential and introduce uh, uh, novel techniques in fabrication and design uh, uh, actually not only from an acad academic point of view but uh, really into application. So that's why I have those uh, three different heads. Uh, so I'll talk mainly about projects I did during six years at Stuttgart University. Um, I'll show a little bit about my current work at uh, TU Munich and uh, a little outlook uh, towards uh, how we implement that uh, uh, in actually building industry uh, based on the academic uh, precedent work. Um, all of those different works are going to show uh, revolve about a topic that has been in the room for the whole day, like computation and materialization. How do we conceptualize form and structure and how uh, don't we do it in a linear, subsequent way, but how can uh, materialization inform the conceptualization of form from the very beginning? And maybe um, also as a reference to Patrick's Fordism uh, discourse, uh, uh, maybe uh, as a showpiece for um, um, uh, a fabrication paradigm that is more a serial production of uh, identical parts, which is really driven by the industry at the time, and the build and is a really good example to how um, building technology and building culture are very uh, uh, strongly interlinked. And um, the problem with this uh, construction methodology um, is really uh, that nowadays uh, uh, resource consumption in construction is a huge topic, and people address it mainly by upgrading the technology, ventilation, insulation. Uh, but I think uh, what hasn't been addressed uh, enough is actually uh, the hardware. Huh? The, all the um, resources bound in steel, concrete, uh, and uh, if you make up the big calculation about how much construction is necessary uh, uh, to deal with the strong urbanization worldwide and the building methods currently in play, uh, that would uh, not really uh, work out with the resources that we have at hand. So um, what we look uh, look at, or what I looked at in the uh, previous six years uh, as a researcher at the University of Stuttgart, is um, biological structures, because they uh, feature several things that are really interesting and would be really beneficial to implement in architecture as well, uh, which is they are highly material efficient uh, and functionally integrated. And they do so by having uh, similar components locally differentiated. So by the methods and the methods of uh, morphogenesis, uh, so the forming and making uh, of its structure, um, in nature um, we can afford unique pieces that are locally adapted. And uh, that is a potential that just recently becomes available for building construction with uh, computational design and robotic fabrication, slowly leaving the academic realm and coming into application in building construction. So that train of thought is not uh, really new. Uh, so for example, also a reference from Stuttgart is uh, uh, Fry Otto's constructions and how uh, materialization and form are interrelated. For example, the negotiation that such a soap film bubble uh, does with its internal stresses and the form that is re resulting from that. So this curve is not drawn by a genius architect, but it's really a negotiation of structure and material. And we try to revisit that with the current uh, repertoire of tools that we have at hand, uh, which we do in a very integrative way, as I said. So there's not a subsequent way of design, simulation, fabrication. But we try to have all these three pieces uh, simultaneously inform our uh, design process. And uh, we can do so by using computational design tools and only because we have the direct uh, connection between the design tool and the fabrication outcome. So obviously that also requires a very interdisciplinary approach, especially when we uh, wanted to integrate those uh, biological construction principles. Uh, and uh, for that we really see um, 
that the knowledge nowadays is no longer gained in the depths of one discipline, but more in the in at the intersection of multiple disciplines coming together. And that's a really interesting place to be as an architect, especially working with computational design tools, because the tool that uses those boundary informations from other um, research partners uh, as a design driver in your um, geometry generation and fabrication really allows you to be this central hub where that information flows together, that point of confluence, uh, uh, where this is really um, informing your design. And what is very important, um, uh, I think, is that we regularly test these in one-to-one -one prototypes. So there's a series of projects that I'm going to uh, talk about. And um, historically in architecture, um, pavilions has often served as a demonstrator for one research aspect that you can push further, or a new technological advancement or a new uh, design paradigm that you want to showcase while leaving several other aspects that you need to deal with in architecture away. For example, these are extremely lightweight constructions, uh, but they barely house any program at this point. They're more, it's more important uh, to gain the knowledge along the way and ask new questions for the follow-up project rather than the piece uh, itself. Although it's always very important to say that um, this is always a piece of architecture and uh, it's always something that, that stands for something that could be implemented on a larger scale. Um, so there's a series of projects that I worked at um, uh, on within the last uh, six years. And uh, they all built on the idea of using very bespoke filament structures and fiber composite uh, uh, constructions that are extremely light, extremely material efficient, but what is very important at the same time also express their materiality and the processes that they're based on in a novel design repertoire. So that's uh, why I think that, that this is a really good example for um, uh, technology as a design driver in architecture. And uh, I always like to compare it with early material experimentations, for example, in Victorian greenhouses with early iron cast structures, uh, where the structures are not, uh, not yet um, standardized and according to code, but where you can really explore what the material actually uh, allows you uh, to do. And um, we will go through the whole line of research from the initial biomimetic research investigating beetle shells towards larger scale uh, implementation. And that's actually an innovation cycle that we went through uh, uh, quite quickly, looking at uh, how conservative building industry often is. So um, I'll talk a little bit about why we're working with filament structures. Uh, and for that, we need to start with the biological role model. Um, for example, what you see here is a pinch claw of a lobster. And the interesting aspect here is not only its geometry, which is only highly adapted to its uh, function, but also the material it is composed of. So um, this is a chitin uh, um, composite material, which is differentiated across multiple scales in hierarchy. And um, maybe uh, from this scale on, we can actually implement that and use that design uh, understanding of starting with the material as a bottom-up exploration uh, with technical composite materials and architecture, tailoring uh, structural capacity locally and integrating other functions. So interestingly, this is in nature not only a thin shell, which is highly performative, but also integrates uh, climate regulation func functions, for example. And that's the unique feature we see in natural structures. For example, wood is also a, a fiber composite with cellulose fibers, um, or a tendon or a connective tissue um, is both the same collagen fiber, just arranged in different ways. So what does it mean for architecture if we can gain that control of our materiality and tailor the material to the structures we want to build? So we uh, implement that, as I said, with technical composite structures. You need to imagine it like a string-like filament, which is then impregnated uh, with resin. And when that hardens, it makes a really highly performative and very light structure. Um, that has also been tested in architecture um, uh, a while ago, for example, the Futuro, Futuro House, um, um, Marty Surunen. Uh, but the problem at that time was not the material, but more the methods applied. So we were still in the paradigm of serial fabrication, uh, which nowadays is often the case in composite industry uh, still today. So for example, Siemens wind blades are made from glass fiber composite. But the material is here a passive receptor of form. So there's a hugely expensive formwork, and they just put the fibers there, start until they're cured, and then the fiber has a shape of the formwork. And if we now want to look into more articulated, differentiated structures, we would need a hell lot of different formworks. So the first thing that we did is we looked into the technology that we have at hand to build this uh, in a more differentiated and individually adapted way. Which, for example, here, crazy colors. Uh, 
shows a robot applying the fiber on a really reduced scaffold. We only need those teeth here at the tip. And in between, you see the fibers interacting in space. Uh, so when I span a line from point A to B, it's a straight line. But as soon as these start with the pretension, start to reciprocally deform each other in space, we get really interestingly doubly curved shapes that we can use for our structures. So here you see how it's scaled up. We have a scaffold here, and here you see the carbon and glass fiber placed by the robot. And um, it's really highly dependent on the sequence in which the robot applies the form. So the forming of the structure is really happening through the fabrication process and is no longer inscribed in the formwork itself. So in industry, that would be milled from a full block of foam and then polished, and then the fibers would be applied to that. Uh, what that allowed us is uh, not only a technological advancement, but on the other hand also uh, uh, no an exploration of a novel architectural repertoire that is really expressing its fibrous nature. And uh, we, after that project, we said there's a lot of potential in there, and we wanted to keep investigating that. So um, then we went into a prefabricated segmented shell. So previously, that was a large piece fabricated on site. So this is seg segmented and could be um, uh, prefabricated, brought to site. So we do this project together with our students and industry support. And here we started again the bottom-up exploration of what are interesting lightweight structures uh, that utilize the capacity of filament structures that can be abstracted and then translated into an architectural construction process. So what we did is we, with biologists, we uh, scanned those beetle shells, which has a have a very interesting cavity uh, in their shell structure. And um, obviously, you can see that you need to abstract quite a bit. You can't build all those features of the biological role model because in the end, you don't want to build a beetle, but a structure. But it comes down to those two parameters that I mentioned in the beginning, those two aspects of uh, geometry, so doubly curved shapes, uh, which are uh, really good um, performing against buckling, and the material organization. How are the fibers aligned in the structure? That can be abstracted in... Uh, local uh, articulations of building units and their global relations within each other. And that can be really nicely realized by our call of filament winding structure uh, te technology. So the doubly curved shape here is really emerging through the sequence of applying the fibers, while the formwork is reduced to this linear edge up here, which is quite easy to build and to change. Um, in that case now, um, the robot is holding the frames and winding the pieces. And I'm showing this not because it's like a great piece of engineering, but mainly because this is part of the design process in a very integrated way of working. So every decision, every de degree of freedom you integrate at this point of the development stage of the technology has then a profound impact on what you can design as an architect uh, since it's uh, defining the degrees of freedom you can work with and is also directly informing your... Uh, digital morphogenesis, if you want to call it, uh, where a lot of boundary parameters are actually negotiated uh, within the computational design process. So the next step we then see based on their local loading conditions, there's this uh, algorithmic description of how the fibers uh, need to be applied to that structure, uh, on the one hand to achieve a certain geometry, and on the other hand to align the fiber within the force flow direction. What you see, see here is reconfigurable frames, so we can adjust a few parameters and build different geometries. And there's no formwork in between, there's just the fiber spanning uh, in midair. So what you, what you see here is the fiber being picked up by the formwork, and then the robot pulls, and the fiber is compacting all the other fibers. And that curved shape is emerging through that process. So what that allowed us to do is basically build uh, different components with unique geometry and unique fiber layout. And that's really a fabrication paradigm uh, which allows a much higher degree of um, differentiation, not only on a structural level, but also um, on an architectural scale. You can see how the segmented nature of the structure is visible, readable, articulated. And uh, you can see how all those uh, really fine articulate articulated fiber layouts uh, at a really high degree of articulation, which is directly emerging from the underlying fabrication logics, the material character. And um, what looks like a very flimsy um, piece of ropes here is actually super strong. So for example, we had 36 students climbing on top uh, of that, uh, using that as a um, viewing stage for the World Soccer uh, Cup. And there's like, Again, like the shadows, how are they casted, the light catching the fiber. So all, all of these are really great design features that we can work with then as uh, architects. 
Um, we did small side products, a side of that as well, so where we had different design drivers, for example, stackable components, reduced number of connections using only carbon fiber uh, for a fair stand. And uh, that was modular and could be showed in different uh, variations and really shows the viability of these construction systems uh, for various applications in design uh, and construction. Um, how much the design repertoire is actually then also um, influenced uh, by the fabrication technology uh, can be seen, for example, with this project where we used a different technique, where we worked with the aerospace engineers and how they can, uh, in a 2D sheet, tailor different fiber arrangements and how that then led to more like a surface-like uh, structure. And that's something that we picked up for a follow-up uh, project. Uh, but here we were following much more... Um, um, a behavioral design paradigm. So what we looked here at is how does the water spider um, build a very interesting fiber structure underwater. And the interesting part is here again, how can I build differentiated structures in an interesting way without uh, using a lot of resources for the formwork. And uh, interestingly, if you have different anchor points, if you have different currents at play, the fiber follows a very robust set of instructions and always finds a very interesting uh, solution to the problem and comes up with a highly differentiated fiber structure. So that again was then uh, challenging our way of designing and fabricating if we want to use that kind of uh, design thinking and fabrication paradigm in our project. And in our case then basically the robot became the fabrication agent that had a lot of sensors embedded and was then responding online while putting fibers uh, uh, Onto, onto the gel. And therefore, the fiber layouts that were uh, generated were highly emergent. They were no longer predefined, but we really gave a lot of that uh, local authorship of the appearance uh, to the process itself, but still controlling the boundary levels more on a, on a, a meta level. So here you see how that shape is still closed here with a plastic foil, um, ETFE film, inflated. And then later, when it was reinforced and stiffened, we could uh, take the sides out and had a very thin and performative structure with, again, very highly articulated uh, uh, material with all the shadows and the sun effects. So this is not only a super efficient structure um, in terms of resources and weight, but uh, uh, the underlying um, materiality and processes are also really uh, highly expressive and also purposefully used uh, uh, in that way. So based on that, um, we got a follow-up project that's like the largest one that we implemented so far in the academic uh, context, where we were conducted, uh, contacted by um, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London uh, to build a piece uh, in the context of the engineering season, which showcases how engineering can drive architectural design. And um, what we wanted to do here is not just implement a project as we had it built before on a larger scale, but we wanted to look into a process that we haven't uh, focused so much on, which is functional integration. Yeah? So we wanted to see how is that uh, structure performing not only in a structural way, but um, also how is it behaving um, the behavior of um, affecting the behavior of people, how are the force flows in the structure? Um, how uh, does it, uh, which kind of um, microclimatic implica implications has such a kind of structure? Um, we wanted to close the loop. We didn't wa just want to embed sensors and then learn from that for the next project. But what we did, we actually brought the fabrication cell on site and then could deal with or develop um, the canopy as an organism that responds and evolves over time. So for that, we have the loop where, where we measure the current state. We have our sensors that informs then the fiber layout. So fiber structures have a very high integrative capacity where uh, you can adapt and uh, uh, change certain parameters uh, to for certain effects. Uh, for example, we were um, uh, measuring uh, certain um, climatic aspects under the, under the canopy. And surprisingly, although it's just a canopy without closed walls, uh, there were really interesting uh, local microclimates uh, showing up and then p how people utilize the space and what that means for the structure could be translated into a very differentiated set of components. So these now have like a, a unified boundary conditions, but within the component, the geometry and the fiber layout are um, highly uh, differentiated. Um, so what you see here is the glass and the carbon fiber. Those are the main two materials uh, that we use. The glass fiber is... Uh, uh, cheaper, less performant, uh, has less energy embodied, embodied, and the carbon fiber is used very selectively to reinforce the pieces. 
And that again then had a beautiful shadow pattern cast. Uh, we integrated the steel columns to show how an interface with a conventional building system could look like. So the academic uh, pavilions before were always like showing the system in its purity and how far can you push the boundaries. And here we tried to incorporate a few steps towards an application in, 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 in the building sector. Uh, for example, we also uh, integrated um, uh, a facade support system. Uh, again, the light is a very interesting aspect, how the glass fiber catches the light and how the illumination is really a strong uh, feature of that um, uh, project. Here, for example, you see the shingled roof that we um, uh, applied, applied here. The reflection in the pond. And I think those images really show that this is not only a building technological advancement, but really developing a novel construction and design uh, uh, repertoire that is... Uh, very performative. So, for example, this whole piece uh, weighs as, as much as a square meter of this uh, brick wall. And um, through its more atmospheric qualities, it was used for, uh, for events uh, where uh, the light uh, show was, so it was integrated part of the, of, the, uh, of the light show, of the band playing, for example. And uh, I think that's a really good uh, application scenario as well. Um, it was then set up at the Vitra campus, uh, where it then, in, in its changed uh, configuration and uh, changed location, uh, had a really different um, appearance. And um, generally, I think um, going through all these developments uh, within six years is like a big leap in terms of technology, but also a big leap in terms of showcasing how uh, uh, those structures uh, could be applied in a very performative way, on the one hand. so. Densification in urban areas, you need to deal with complex geometric uh, boundary conditions. You can only induce reduced weights onto existing structures, for example. Uh, we need to address the problem of resource consumption in construction. But I think when we leave that to just uh, technological advancements or increasing the insulation of the skin, uh, it will end up quite horribly from an architectural perspective. So it's really important to use that as a design opportunity uh, that architects need to deal with. And uh, since, based on these projects, we got a lot of requests for these kind of structures. Um, uh, I started uh, my own uh, company, uh, offering the robotic fabrication of these filament uh, structures. So uh, uh, we are quite lucky that we can continue um, the industry partnerships that we developed over those uh, projects uh, with the material fabricators or KUKA uh, providing robots, uh, uh, things like that. And there's like an interesting series of projects that... Uh, uh, where this might come into application. And uh, we are not only looking uh, at um, facades or be load bearing structures, but also more onto uh, micro architectures uh, or furniture scale. And um, we are also uh, yeah, building prototypes here in corporations uh, with other uh, companies. So, um, Touching on the research that just started in uh, Munich, so uh, one was based on also a request from an industry partner who was developing a larger scale PV panel supports uh, for car industry that want to showcase also the character of electromobility uh, and uh, want to use the large car parks that they have anyways to charge uh, to charge their cars. So we were looking into uh, efficient, quick ways of um, uh, building those filament structures, obviously because it was uh, in a studio environment at university, uh, there were also some more experimental projects, uh, for example like this, using uh, uh, that's the reference project from Festo, but one could actually speculate that one can use this inflated tubes and a pre-braided carbon fiber tube to build quite interesting uh, structures, we call it like a macro fiber structure, and others like where you can uh, from the robotic fabrication constraints derive a set of components that allow you to build like a very differentiated grid that can then house these uh, things. So another aspect that we're currently working on is um, we got selected to build a project for the Luminale in Frankfurt, uh, which is usually like a light uh, light and art exhibition, but in this, this year they expanded it a little bit to the topics of uh, green cities, smart cities. And so we, we teamed up with a few partners that we already worked with for the project at the v &A Museum, where we had these integrated centers, uh, and um, added a partner from, uh, from the green, uh, green Technology Department, and want to see how can we integrate uh, plants as... Uh, as performance features in these structures, uh, filtering air, uh, providing shade uh, and uh, shelter. 
And uh, yeah, the prototype for that will also be then produced uh, in our company in Stuttgart. So we'll have the students over, have a robotic fabrication workshop, and uh, uh, that will be another showpiece that we can build. So with that, uh, I'm done with my lecture, and uh, I hope you enjoyed <laughs> the whole day, and uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you, Moritz. Uh, some questions from the publicum? There is one question. Yep. Andras. Hey, um, it's more like a comment than a question. So, uh, 2016, like, uh, I'm from like North Carolina State University. Our university invited Professor Magus, if I pronounce it correctly, to from Stuttgart University, who also teaches in GSD, uh, to give a speech. And that's the first time I saw your project. I can promise you there was like 150 people there. We were all shocked by it. And uh, I spent a couple of hours to understand that. Mostly, like, you guys did a lot of research in Rhino and stuff like that. And um, that's really, like, inspires me and many other students to start work on this. And uh, I think this applies to every uh, professors who give a lecture today. You guys are not just pushing the boundaries of architecture, but also promoting architecture to young students, to young architects, by do giving speech as amazing as like this. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have ma one more comment yeah, there. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was very interesting lecture. Um, I wanted to ask about the Elytra filament pavilion, the one of 2016. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned it was made uh, mainly by two materials, glass fiber, and I didn't uh, listen the name of the other one, but I think I understood it was more structural kind of function. Could you please uh, explain a little bit more about yep. this? One? So what is important that um, generally building with fibers can be done with a broad variety of materials. And I think uh, the filament winding process that we have with our robot is very interesting because it's an additive process. Yeah? There's basically no waste. And you add the fiber in the direction where it should be in the part. Um, you can do that with different materials. So currently in our, our company, we make experiments with uh, flex fiber. Uh, we have... Um, different matrices, not only epoxy resin, but you also work with ceramic resin, which is completely fireproof. Uh, so there's really a wide, wide, wide variety of materials available that allow you to uh, work within this para paradigm of design and fabrication. Um, so what we mainly use so far uh, in the project before is glass and carbon fiber. Um, which uh, is commonly used, for example, in aerospace construction, everywhere where you need very light and performative uh, structures. Uh, and uh, the problem is that we can't directly transfer those methods from aerospace industry to building industry because there's very different uh, boundary conditions uh, at play. Uh, so that's why this process is more tailored towards building construction uh, as well. And um, yeah, we use glass and carbon fiber uh, specifically in these projects, but there's various materials uh, uh, available that you can use for similar kind of construction. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, you went through like uh, on-site and off-site fabrications. I want to ask: In your future, do you want to focus on both, or do you have a? Where do you see more potential? Yeah. So there's um, there's in situ fabrication uh, on-site and prefab basically. So in situ is always um, uh, yeah. What was mentioned before a lot in other uh, lectures, basically also the including the assembly and ba basically making the piece um, in its uh, final location um, at the building site. The problem is that you then have to deal with a lot of uncontrollable uh, boundary conditions often. 
So I think what might be interesting is um, like an on-site or close-to-site fabrication, where if you see that the material that we use basically is, is, is wound on a spool, so the whole canopy at the B&A uh, could basically put on two Euro pellets, one with resin, one with fiber, plus a robot, which is when it's in, tr in the transportation state, also roughly this, the size of a, of a pellet. So basically on, on around three pellets, you can get everything you need to build the pavilion. Of course, there's like tooling and all kind of stuff around. But in a few containers, you could bring a mobile factory basically to site and produce large pieces right there, pick it up with the crane, put it, put it in position. Um, on the other hand, currently in our company, uh, we start with prefab uh, on-site, so we got our hall, we have our robot installed, and it just gives us more control of the boundary conditions. And um, for a few projects that we got contacted for, they also already asked, okay, why can't we do it right here? Why do we need to produce it in your company and then ship it over? Um, but we always say that that might be a later step of the development. Currently, we, we focus on prefab. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Moritz, for uh, the great lecture.